Good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you're joining us from, and welcome to Biyacha Together, spirited by HAU. You are tuned into Guts and Grit in Uncertain Times, and it's going to be a fascinating conversation. My name is Deb Engel Collin, and I am the Relationship Manager for the Miller Introduction to Judaism program here at HAU. I am delighted to introduce HAU's own Rabbi Cheryl Peretz, Associate Dean of the Ziegler School of Rabbinic Studies, where she received her ordination. Rabbi Peretz also has an MBA in Marketing Management from Baruch College and helps bring those skills and expertise into the operational practices of rabbis and congregations throughout North America. (coughs) Excuse me. Rabbi Peretz will be in conversation with Dr. Erica Miller, exploring how we can prepare for what no one can be ready for during this new year. Dr. Erica Miller was born in 1933 in Chernovitz, Romania, and when she was seven, Erica and her family were imprisoned in a Nazi holding camp in the Ukraine for four miserable years until they were liberated by the Russians. When she was 15, her family immigrated to Israel, and Erica attended high school at night while working during the day. She served in the Israeli Air Force and worked for the Israeli Government Tourist Information Office. She moved to Los Angeles in 1958, where she attended and graduated from AJU. She earned a PhD in clinical psychology, got married, had kids, taught Hebrew, and today she is an entrepreneur, international best-selling author, inspirational speaker, active member of Temple Aliyah in Woodland Hills, and Center to Club member of APAC. Talk about guts and grits. This is going to be an amazing conversation. I can tell you that right now. I'm going to ask you to put your questions, um, dear member, dear audience audience participants, in the Q&A section, and Rabbi Peretz will look at them as she is in conversation with Dr. Miller. I'm going to say goodbye to you all now, and I'll see you at the other end of this. I'm so looking forward to this. So Dr. Miller, Rabbi Peretz, it's all yours. Thank you so much, Deb, and Shana Tova um, to everyone on our call. Happy New Year. Um, I can't think of a better topic to be thinking about resilience and guts and, and really how we define and redefine ourselves to overcome any challenges that we might face. And so I'm delighted to be joined by Dr. Miller, who I know you're going to find to be Uh, an insightful, humorous, and engaging uh, conversation between us. So thank you, Dr. Miller, for being here. And I was wondering if you could just begin by telling us a little bit about yourself, your background. I know you have a very colored background, a little bit of which we heard in the bio, that with an eye towards really like, what makes you such an expert on this idea of how we overcome adversity? Uh, because I'm not fake news. I lived through, uh, I am seasoned, I'm a storyteller, and I have lived through epidemics and wars and stuff. So uh, mere fact that I can be here with you and sharing my glorious, uh, I should watch my words, glorious is too high end. It's, you know, an amazing life journey. So the title of the webinar a guts and grit. I'm missing one more word that I would like to add because one of my mantras is guts, grit, and gusto or gusto. It's very important not to forget the gusto because guts is courage. It takes courage to, to navigate a life journey. It takes grit to postpone gratification, to get titles like you and me. But the very important part is gusto, gusto. Be grateful that you're alive. Be in the moment. Celebrate what you have, not what you don't have. So this is my mantra, and it is very timely always, especially in our challenging times right now. I thought you were going to add a fourth G, which is glamour. Um. (laughs) A girl girl is not supposed to give her age. Are you kidding me? And I flaunt it. I cannot put my arms around me. I'll be 87 next month. Look at me. No, you cannot see my girlish finger because I'm sitting. But it's like, yeah, life is an amazing journey. Life choices we make is important. So it's not all about me, but it is because I'm sharing myself and youngins like you, Rabbi, and all those out there, you want what I got. Because again, uh, life choices, 
I've been exercising in the gym, whatever, for 40 years, weight. Huh? Uh, I've been engaged in, I'm a pescatarian. I eat well. My attitude is my cup is half full, not empty. So my point being is, if you got something good, share it. So I didn't have a model like me, and I, I never brag, I just share. So audience, hey, I, I, I'm not very humble, but again, I'm just having fun because life, I don't know why we are here, but we are not alone. And, and uh, by my l latest book, uh, Living, uh, you know, long and, you know, chronologically gifted uh, to 123, which I'm going to live. How come 123? Because somebody lived at 122 in 64 days. Therefore, <laughs> I can beat it in being in the book of Guinness, huh? So the important part is, is Yachat. It is, it's more than us. We are part of the community. We're reaching out. Look what we're doing. Look at, look at Rabbi Paris. Look at the university. Look at us. We're part of the community. And this is one of the very important ingredients to live long and well. Not just living long, but living long and well. So, so Dr. Miller, your background is, um, is such a unique one. And you've lived through so many um, moments where you've chosen resiliency, where you've overcome adversity. I wonder if you could tell us two or three of those key experiences and um, how you really cultivate for yourself through those experiences this sense that you can overcome anything and you can do anything you want to put your heart to doing. Anything, anything. And then knowing too, we have to surrender for destiny because life choices are important. We don't ask to be born and we don't, most of us, we don't want to die. We never know when. So life choices we make is really important to be in the here and now. Now, the first memory, resilience, by the way, I'm a professor, I'm a lecturer, I'm all over the place, but uh, resilient because I've been asked is resilience something that we all have or is it something you can learn or some people are luckier than others? So I want to assure you people, uh, audience, you rabbi, that uh, resilience is a trait, innate, innate trait that we all have uh, based on our ancestors, fight and flight, all right? But again, it can be learned. Some of us are lucky that we are more prone to that and some can, there are tools, skills, and we are going to get there if you are going to ask me, how do we get the tools in order to incorporate now and forevermore when we are in trouble? Uh, how can we uh, go into us in innate place and, and figure out how we survive? Okay, the first time that I remember looking back, I did not know it then, uh, the, the feeling of resilience, um, we were hoarded, we were hiding in the void and all that kind of thing, but we were hoarded into the cattle train, all those Jews, we went there in, in, in Romania. I did not understand the mayhem. Remember, I was seven years old. And I asked questions. I'm not Einstein, but I was a really curious little kid. And nobody would tell me nothing. You know, a child, when I saw the mayhem, I saw people shot and babies thrown away and my father in the mud being beaten. I wanted to help him. I mean, I could not understand. And hearing schmutzige Juden, schmutzige dirty Jews. And I kept on asking, mother, what's going on there? And she kept on putting her hand over my mouth, not to ask questions, not to go to help Papa because I could be shot. So, uh, I, you know what, how does a little kid, I saw around people were wailing, crying. My mother was stoic, but my father was like this, and my sister, all the sisters, she was crying. So when we were herded into the cattle train, and by the way, in Washington, D.C., I went year, a few years ago, and there a copy of this cattle train, and with pictures, and I said, I looked for myself. I was there. So we were hoarded in the back there, and it was absolutely, you barely could breathe. So I just said, okay, did not know what goes on. So I entertained myself. I listened to the train started to go till next station. I heard the noise of the train of the wheels. Ta -ta 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 -ta. So I was thinking to myself, 
schmutzige Juden, ta-ta-ta, schmutzige Juden, ta-ta-ta. So I came to the rescue to myself, when other people were screaming and crying, I was singing to myself to comfort myself. That is resilience if that isn't. I was very quick, what do I do? I just, you know, so is it, I, it is innate, but many people don't have it instantly, but I did. That was the first example, looking back, how resilient for a little seven-year-old to kind of try to entertain myself in order to not, what, freak or, or, or whatever. Uh, that was the first one I could, I have so many of them, that how I quickly fight or flight, figuring it out, and then freak, like in, in Los Angeles, then the earthquake, all right? I just moved around it, whatever, when it was all over, then I started shaking, never crying, because crying is weakness. In the Israeli Air Force, being, being in the northern border, when shooting, I was in the dungeons, and here the shooting, and here I had to make sure to, to pay attention. And, and again, that is another example. I am I'm a girl, but I'm strong. I'm Jewish. Don't tell me because I'm Jewish, I cannot, I cannot live. So that kind of grit, it's always part of me. It's like I am who I am because of it, in spite of it. Don't tell me because I'm Jewish, I have to die. Don't tell me because I'm a girl, I cannot climb trees with boys. Don't tell me I cannot be married, have children in a profession. Don't tell me I cannot climb Mount Everest or jump out of a plane. I mean, my point is that I kind of, in all the time knowing, oh my gosh, I'm still here. I never thought I would live long enough to get married or anything because I have a relationship with death. Meaning to life is because of death. And before I forget, don't freak audience, I have a custom made casket in my, in my bedroom. In downtown Los Angeles, there's some Israelis and they have this big, you know, this, that you can make custom made for any kind of wood which starts and according to your size. Because I decided, uh, no regrets, my, my life, is got all in order, but then when the time comes, I want to make sure that at least I see this beautiful piece of wood and not like my husband, Jerry. Eight years ago, he died on me after 53 years of marriage. I buy the casket, beautiful casket, and then you don't see it. So I wanted to buy one and keep it. So the people there at Stephen, wherever they were, they said, are you crazy? We don't sell that and the caskets. You can go to Costco and... Anyways, I'm going to go all over the place. Yeah. So the biggest other resilience is to be married. I always wanted to be a healer so I could actually take care of this contorted woman that got lost from everybody and was with, with us together. And no opportunity in Israel, uh, in Jerusalem medical school, I could not. So when I felt safe here, when my son went to first grade, then I decided to go back to school. Never mind, nobody wanted me to. Eight years later, I had my PhD and I became a healer. I ran 10 mental health clinics. I dealt with the courts, domestic violence, anger management, about respect. So yeah, if this is not resilient, what is? I didn't plan it. I just followed, I followed my journey, my passion of being here trying to understand people, trying to see what can I do to empower others. And here I am. Shut up. <laughs> That's great. Dr. Brown, I want to make an observation and then ask you a question. Um, so after all, I'm a rabbi. So the language I use is the Torah's language and the rabbi's language. And as you were talking, I couldn't help but think of um, passages like, as one example from Devarim, from the book of Deuteronomy, where Moses tells us, like, um, that in God's name, like, like um, look, look right now at what I place in front of you. I place in front of you blessings and curses, life and death. And the passage ends, and you should choose life. And this guts and grit and resilience is really a form of choosing life. And while you have a beautiful relationship of acknowledging that death will come eventually, um, I love that it's about embracing life. That's my, my, my comment. My question for you also, as you were just talking, um, I heard a little piece in what you said that I'm pretty sure that somebody out in the audience might have heard also. And that's what you said at one point, no tears, tears are a sign of weakness. And- Oh, no what? 
No tears. Oh, no tears. And what I want to ask you is because I'm a big fan of Brene Brown, who's, uh, um, as you know, uh, also a world-renowned psychologist, who asks us um, to see the strength in embracing our vulnerability. And so I want to ask you, like, what role is there for embracing vulnerability in order to be resilient? Uh, no tears. I did not mean now. Uh, it, okay. <laughs> No tears because everybody else was crying and screaming. At the time, got it. At the time, and I was a bad girl. I didn't listen to mama. So I was hit by my papa and I did not give them the thing. I did, they didn't cry in front of them. Then I cried in private. So that mm -hmm. was then. Crying is a wonder because I am so strong, but I'm frail and vulnerable too. So there is no free lunch. So embracing all of me, and that is my point being, is it is like, a life doesn't owe us anything, and there's more than meets the eye. See, you are a rabbi, so you, you know, God is part of your daily, of your environment, whatever. I struggle with God, and, and the rabbi Vogel, he kind of like, you know, what I said, I, I don't know, but I know that I'm so Jewish. Uh, being in, in the temple, being part of the community, if somebody would come out of space and ask me one word to define yourself, I have many titles, as you know, a little bit, I would say Jewish. How can you be Jewish with struggling with God? Although, uh, all have, you know, we struggled in the town, so struggling with God is not new. But again, I'm just saying it's amazing uh, now the holidays, I miss being part of the community. I don't read the text, forgive me, Rabbi. I think it's really boring to read. I just like to sing and canter, you know, you know, Mike, you know, in the in the in the in the temple. So being part of the community, it is absolutely part of my, you know, what my ancestry, my DNA. So when I was asked once, um, you know, but you suffered so much. Why did you stay Jewish? I think my granddaughter, it was in the temple once, you know, interviewing me as far as how, what that kind of thing. So uh, I said, you can't. Once you're Jewish, you're Jewish. I'm so Jewish. But again, it is like, I love it. They're very unique. I don't mean to be prejudiced, but we are so resilient as a people. Look at us. Look at the Jews in Africa. Look at the Jews all over the place. And people are jealous of us because we are survivors. We are resilient. And again, our ancestors more than others, remember, we live now in, 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 in challenging time for most. And it's really interesting. I, had, I wrote an article in some older ma magazine, not the ARP, another one. And uh, I did not know where to put myself because they're the millennials, they're the boomers and all that. So I found out that my age group is called silent generation. Silent? Am I silent? <laughs> so, I can't imagine you being silent about anything. <laughs> I did not have a voice then, but now you cannot shut me up. Yes, you can. So again, we are speaking and having a voice. So the, so the elder population, like me, we are maybe physically a little bit impaired, not me. I am this, what can I not do today that I can do 40 years ago? But I don't brag, I just share. So physically, the, the silent generations are doing maybe not so well, but psychologically they are, because they live through the wars, Vietnam, you know, 11. They've been around for a while. The worst ones are the youngins, like my grandson, Eli. You know, when, you know, I think he's 15 or 16. I cannot catch up with ages. He's so worried. When they, we are together now as a family, and, you know, Rosh Hashanah and the uh, young people break the fastest in my house. I'm a hugger. I miss it. I live by myself. Mm -hmm. So everybody, five grandkids and my, my children and their significant others, I hug, all right? He's the one, Eli. Maybe not. He can is worried about me. So my point being is that they're challenging time and we have been around for a while and we, it shall also pass. It is how do you live through it right now? We are this not... I actually want to ask you about. I'm going to come back to the Judaism and the high holidays in a few moments, but I want to just focus on this time of the world because I think for every one of us, the last six to seven months, has called upon us to make some adjustments to what our expectations are, to the way we live our life, 
and um, and and that's hard to to not being with community, not being with family. What are the the um, ingredients to to being able to capture a sense or train yourself to be resilient during this um, challenging time in our world? Okay. Uh, talking to oneself, just like in the train, in the, you know, I, I sang to myself to comfort myself, to come to ourselves, to be our nurturing parents, saying, okay, this shall also pass. I don't have to like it. Mm -hmm. Give me life. Everything's not a big deal. So I'm not normal. I don't put myself down because to me, I'm still here. I will figure it out because remember, we are not our, we are, but we are not our ancestors. We don't worry that the other tribe will take us over or a bear is going to eat us up. We are here, unusual times. How are we going to survive and look at us zooming? And people are resilient more than you would think, and especially the older. Uh, you know, what can you do rather what you cannot do? So it is like in something, something good will come out of it. Some people will be able to, especially women, because they're still uh, expected to, to bear the children. I guess the guys cannot do it yet. They've not figured it out yet. So it's kind of nice to be able to, to be from home for a few months while your baby is whatever. So something comes out. The universe, us, nothing stays in the same thing. Complete peace is death. We are speaking about their resilience. We're not dinosaurs. So we need to come to ourselves and say, okay, uh, right now I cannot do this, but I can do that. Okay, uh, I, let me, now I have a little bit more time. Let me see, what have I dreamt about? I've never done it. How can I already have a vision before I can make it happen? Something new, once the craziness is over, maybe I can do this or that. So uh, there's a lot of creativity and innate that we have if we pause and if we see, listen to somebody like me or you, because we are inspiring people and we don't brag, right? It is like, all right, let's, let's do what we can. Let's reach out. If we live by ourselves, let's make sure that we zoom, uh, let's assure, but please, especially having the vision beyond the schmutz. It is, the day will come and let us be excited. We don't have to do anything different, but let us plan and be excited in this moment that we don't know what, that we are lucky to survive. New beginnings can be all the new. That is how we are evolving. We are in the process of evolving forever as a personal person, as a community, as a society. We are never going to stop. We are not dinosaurs. And it's very exciting. Life is an amazing journey. Cut. Before my next question, <laughs> um, I have some good news for you because um, while you say you struggle with um, how you might actually think or feel um, the spiritual aspect of Judaism, I think that um, it's not so very different than what you're articulating. So I remember I had the honor of being um, the first person to do one of these Biyachad programs. And I taught about resiliency during the time of the pandemic. And, um, and in that, I came across this amazing verse from the book of Proverbs that said, that when there's anxiety in our heart, um, the rabbis debate whether that means to talk about it or to set it aside, depending on how you read the word yesachena. And something good, like a good word, will turn it into joy, which, of course, for the rabbis meant divrei uh, Torah, like words of Torah. But they expanded and said, so like when we have anxiety in our heart, which is real, we're all going to have anxiety. But there's different ways that we can um, overcome that and become resilient. We can share it with someone and talk about it. Yes, we can put it up on a shelf sometimes because we need a distraction. But ultimately, the seeds of hope, the seeds of resiliency come from um, choosing to do something good. And whether that something good is for yourself or an act of altruism to help someone else, I think that's what I hear in what you're saying. Look to the vision beyond this moment. And, and that leads me to the time of the year that we're in right now and my next question for you. The good news, by the way, in case you weren't sure, is that uh, you're more Jew spiritually Jewish than you uh, 
uh, than you uh, wanted to do. And I promise yes, not to I don't see what I cannot see, so what can I tell you? Go ahead. I promise not to tell Rabbi Vogel. <laughs> He likes me to come and visit with him. He says, you keep me young. You know, yeah. right. so I, I, have, I give him a hard time. So here's the question that I want to ask you. The question that I want to ask you is, um, this time of the year is all about resiliency. The, the period between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, and I would argue even Sukkot and Sukkot, and Sukkot Torah and Shemini Tzer, is really about saying, how can I turn, return, relive, re-experience my life in new ways. And so I want to ask you a two-part question because you're doing that every day. So um, what, what, what then is the work of resiliency around, the, around Yom Kippur if I'm doing it every day? What's the marker for the season, if you will, right? And the second part that I want to ask you is, um, when you're in community, which you articulated you love being in community as part, as part of a Jewish community, and you're singing those songs, what are you thinking about? Okay. <laughs> uh, see, when I am, see, I think a lot. I'm in my brain, the voice of reason. But when I am part in the community, especially in shul, I don't think, I feel. I sing. I feel safe. It's like being part of the Jewish community. It is so safe. So when I came, I was in a Catholic country. So when we came back from the, from the Holocaust, the first time I went to school was in fifth grade, a Catholic school. And I was there looking around, is there anybody else that is not Jewish? They all make their crosses. So being, oh, looking over the shoulder, this will be coming to Israel and be the majority. I felt safe. I thought all Jews should be in Israel. And I, I used to judge my girlfriends. They say they're religious or they got married right away. The country needed us. So my point being is that the feeling of being, feeling. So I don't think, I think plenty. But when I sing, that's why I go to concert with my da da daughter, Diana. We just travel to, you know, to, to, to all over the world to see the, the, you know, the Beatles or whatever. So my point being is, uh, this is a time of the year, and uh, it is very much in line with what I'm saying. It is reflecting and having visions. The, I do live life uh, in the moment all the time, because who do I think I am? Tomorrow I could be a corpse. Remember, I already have a, a coffin, you know? But it's like uh, visions, uh, what can I do, rather what I cannot do. And again, uh, and, and being grateful. And that is that we're not dinosaurs. And being Yom Kippur, and I like Yom Kippur because I've been fasting forever. So maybe I'll shed two pounds. That's a good thing. Good the beginning, huh? Okay, big girls, you know what I'm talking about? So it is like the time to, I don't know, but forgiveness, if we can mend with so many families because of politics, because of all kinds of things, money, they're broken or they are, you know, maybe you can mend, but it takes two. And we're speaking about visions, reflecting, what can I do different in the new year? Uh, can I donate more? And without to be a saint, what can I do beyond me? Because when you give, you get back. And that is tikkun olam. That is the Jewish core in us. And we're all human beings all over the place, we're all colors, all genders, whatever. We all have similar needs. But we come with that wisdom from our Talmud, from our rabbi. It's like, you know, but yeah, we question with this and that, but it's like tikkun olam, we part participate as part of repair the world. Look what Israel is doing in Africa, all over the place. You don't hear about it. So, right. so it's every individual. I, can, I cannot change. I can go and vote, and I'm going to. Maybe I can vote twice. Uh, again, but what can I do in order to participate in that tikkun olam? Because by giving, you get. And you're not all alone. I want to invite our participants, uh, our attendees, if you have questions, please write them in the chat. I've been reading your comments. A lot of people want to meet you. A lot of people are inspired by your book. Not, um, none of that is news, um, but, uh, but good to hear. And, um, and what, I wanna, um, what I wanna just say while we're waiting to see if people are writing in questions is that 
Um, what I love about what you just said, for those who are interested in how to make resiliency truly part of your spiritual work for Yom Kippur, um, whether it's in your home, whether it's on Zoom with the community, whatever, in whatever way you're observing it, I heard you saying that the key to that is feeling embraced, feeling seen, feeling um, uh. known, feeling connected, feeling like you matter, feeling like you're not the only one who's struggling with resiliency maybe, or with anxiety over what's happening in your life. And at the same time that because you're not the only one, maybe it's not as um, overwhelming. And that those regular things we try to remind ourselves about on Yom Kippur are key ingredients to creating a life of resiliency. And so um, that's really my next question for you, which is if I want to really train myself, I'm going to ask you for very practical, give me like a, a one month plan for becoming more resilient. What does that look like? What do I need to do every day? What do I need to do every week? What do I need to do once a month? What do I need to do? Okay, it's easy for those like you, like the audience, because you're the audience, you're interested to grow. It is being open to the change, to incorporating some tools if it makes sense to you. And the amazing part is that because it can be learned, it's innate to all of us. It is some the plasticity of the brain, just like our muscle. More you do it, more it gets strong. A changing, first you have, your thinking has to change in order for your, your behavior, then you can do new behavior, and then the feelings will adjust accordingly. Don't pay attention to your feelings. Pay attention, but don't. A little bit anxiety, like stage fright. We were talking about before. I'm so seasoned, but whenever I'm on, I just have a little bit. <laughs> so uh, it is that kind of mantra that you have to be, first of all, open. And you have to know it's possible. So the negative thoughts, whatever they might be, ooh, but what if? What if my son will not be accepted in the college? What if my grandson has to be Zoom and say, wow, all that kind of thing? It is for you to say, okay, uh -uh, here I go again, boring. So channeling that positive thing saying, okay, when I go to those dark sides, I take myself off. I don't want, I switch to some positive thing. It's not forever. By each time, you cannot suddenly be somebody else. You don't have to be somebody else. But changing, changing feelings is based on changing behaviors. It first, you have to give yourself permission. It has to make sense to you that if you decide you are the captain of your boat of life, if you decide you don't want to say, oh my gosh, what if <laughs> all the negativity, then every time you, you have decisions you make, your attitude makes a big difference. So it's not, it's not easy. Who says it's easy? Nothing, too bad. But it is an exercise. Never mind a day. Every time you go to a dark point, you just, uh-uh, here I go again, boring, whether you're extreme, whatever it is, you can, becoming resilient is an activity, is a goal, and you can become, but it's not an automatic, and you're not, the, the response right away is, oh my gosh, but then, uh-uh, I will be fine. Think to yourself, like I did when I was seven years old. Do something, surround yourself with positive people, I have cut off, I don't brag about it, but I've cut off negative people because it affects you. If you have somebody negative in your family, it's a more challenge, you have to learn how to navigate. So this is, I hope I answered, because if you're here and now, at first you have to want it, you have to reflect it, you have to be open, and actually every time this thought, negative thought comes, we are not dinosaurs. We Jews, we, will, we have been there before, we can do it again. It shall okay. always pass. So here's a question that I, I didn't warn you I was going to ask because I didn't think about it until you were just talking about, but I'm wondering if you can comment on the difference between exercising resiliency when facing adversity versus denial. Well, again, uh, it, it, you have to be aware that you're de in denial. People that are in denial, that means they don't know it. And I say something like, maybe I'm in denial. I'm just glad to be, I woke up this morning. 
So, you know, again, it's an ex resilient is incorporating that trait that will save you, that will lengthen your life because stress literally contributes to inflammation of the artery. It lowers your life and life is so short to begin with. So you need to be you, all of you. You need to be motivated to hang on to the word resilient. It's like my second book says, don't tell me I cannot do it. Living audaciously in the here and now, it is a, a decision and you're not going to be level and you're human, but it is like be, without that, uh, hey, this is who I am, forget it. But most of us, if it makes sense to you, you can adapt the resilient concept because you are able to, it's part of our ancestral DNA. Do you hear me? Yeah, what I love about what you're saying, Dr. Miller, is that you're saying that resiliency is not um, ignoring that something's happening. It's actually naming it and deciding to live um, in spite of it or through it. And um, whereas denial says it's not happening. And I think that's a key component that I'm taking away from this and I appreciate that. Um, we have a question from one of our uh, attendees who wants to know, how do I order a custom casket? <laughs> okay. Uh, you have my email. It's, it's so funny. I have the, the casket. It's a Jewish casket. It was a real invent. And nobody wanted to go with me. And my daughter, Diana, blessed be her soul. Mother, nobody will want to come to your house if you have a casket. I've been talking to the casket. So uh, under the bird casket, maybe it's not the time to do that. Uh, it might take time. Oh, here we go. Look at this thing here. Okay. Uh, it is ABC casket. Uh, ABC casket, elegantly crafted uh, wood special since 1933, Israeli couple. Wonderful. Wonderful. So it, Great. So I'm so glad I could give you the answer right away because I have a lot of answers. So we can <laughs> answer that question. Um, we have a few minutes left and what I want to ask you is, so what, um, what, uh, actually, there's a question from a participant that you can answer and in the, also your chance to say whatever else you might want to answer that I haven't asked. But the question from the participant, uh, Morris at Morris Simpson says, so do you just disregard all the chaos that is going on in both politics, anti-Semitism in society that affects your state of mind? Uh if you can handle it, I can handle it. Many can handle it. It's like a bullfight. I doesn't mean, it does not affect me. I'm wonderfully detached. I need to look the thing to keep me feeling safe. But no, uh, if it bothers you, if you have nightmares, whatever, nothing you can do about it. Take care of yourself. Be your nurturing parent. Don't go and listen to whoever if it upsets you because you're a human being. And guess what? It's horrible. And I don't want to just even touch the politics of our days. Disgusting, uh, my, whatever. But again, uh, things don't stay the same. Uh, I know the Israelis, they didn't like Obama much. So when I've been with APEC every two years, but they're so connected. Obama's come and go. Uh, you know, that is the Trump, they're coming and they're going. So what can we do? rather what we cannot do. Protect yourself. You don't need to, you know, if, if something upsets you, it's like sing to yourself. Don't watch it, of course, because you are your nurturing parent. Right. Right. I also think that ties back to what we were saying before. It's not that you're saying to ignore. It's not a saying, oh, that's not really happening. It's naming it and, um, and, and making an active choice to, um, to look beyond it, to look to the future, to say, what can I find that is hopeful? Um, what are the seeds or the kernels of that? And just asking that question starts to take you out of the doldrums of depression or anxiety that can come from the things that challenge you, right? And we have absolutely right. And we have it in our gene pool. What can you do rather what you cannot do? We are problem solvers. Be informed, but don't just dwell on the negativity. What can you do? Can you go vote? Can you contribute? Can you uh, do podcast, whatever? So yeah, you have the, the control. What can you control? Because most people, they're out of control and, and horrible. It sucks. Any loss sucks, whether it's personal or business. If those of us lucky that are going to come out with it healthy, then we have all the stress of life. So we have to be in the present. 
not detachment is good, being informed, but if we find that it affects us because we are put together similar and different, just don't go to that. Don't, don't read that. Don't listen to the naysayers. It's all kind of fake news. Take care of yourself and this will also pass and they will be coming out stronger and wiser. This is a chapter in our life. You don't have to like it. Who likes it? So nothing new. We have gone through in our ancestors plenty of it. It made us who we are, wise and resilient and in and, and, and technology and in space and, and look at the Jewish people. I'm so, I'm so amazed about Israel, the startups, the helping, the tikkun olam, all this kind of thing. So I'm a little bit, you know what, I'm just excited to be alive and I'm sharing with you the passion, not what you cannot do it. Life does, I repeat myself, but I'm an elder, I can do that. Not what you cannot do it. Be lucky you're alive. Life is very short. Be in a moment. And if you have to zoom it, if you cannot hug your loved ones, make sure you tell them I love you. Make sure. Don't have any regrets. Because regrets, I should have, I could have. No, be in the moment. I, I want to add two other things to that um, that you didn't say, but I think you implied. And the first is, um, and, and you know, this is where my spiritual work comes in. So when I think spiritual and psychological are very connected to each other. But um, the first is gratitude. Gratitude is such an important piece of resiliency for me. And the second, which I have to admit, I learn more and more from African-American communities of faith um, all the time, which is a sense of surrender and submission. That's a word Jews don't like when we talk about God. We don't like, because we don't like being out of control, like you said. But the ability to like sometimes give yourself over to like um, asking the questions, even if you don't have the answers or seeking the comfort when you feel uncomfortable, that for me has been an incredible source of resiliency. And, and I think I hear the seeds of that. Like, I don't think we're talking different language, even though you use different words. To me, those are the same. And so um, in our last couple minutes, I just want to, again, is there anything I didn't ask you that you want to answer anyway? <laughs> I just want to amplify, because you're speaking about control. You know, I'm such a control freak, but I know to surrender to destiny. And that's exactly, because we cannot, we'll never know. And again, I could repeat myself, I could go on forever. Uh, it's just the bottom line is, this is always pass. We are lucky, all of those, you, your students of life, all of you, the audience, whether you're here or in Africa, you are in the progress of evolving and you're listening to inspiring people like uh, Rabbi Paris and me. I don't brag, I just share. And again, you are evolving because you're students of life. In order to embrace the yin and the yang, to embrace all that life sends your way, you don't have to understand everything and you're not alone. Reach out to Rabbi Paris. So Reach out to me. Thank you. And Dr. Miller, before uh, Deb takes over again, I just want to um, bless you with many more years of um, not only your own resiliency, but of teaching us to be resilient and of sharing your story of survival and thriving. Um, as we know, we're entering this phase of the world where the stories of those who survived the horrors of the Holocaust, and I know we have many people in our audience who have connections to survive uh, survivors, but that time is coming to a close pretty uh, quickly, and and so the testimony of those who lived through it is so important for those of us who didn't to be able to carry on the the memory and the legacy, and your legacy certainly will continue to be the resiliency that came out of the fires of destruction. So thank you so much. I'm going to echo that, Rabbi Peretz. What a beautiful tribute, and what an and I'm going to say it, inspiring um, hour, uh, 45 minutes of our time. Uh, I don't know if everyone caught on that you have climbed Mount Everest at <laughs> five, which like to me is unbelievable. Jumped out of an airplane at 86. Anything is possible. And I love um, what you said is that, that this is the time we're in and we don't have to like it, but we choose how we're going to embrace it. And I think that's a really powerful um, statement as to the power we have as individuals to choose how we live each and every day. So with that, I will just end with much gratitude, um, which is 
a value that I choose to live by every day. So a gratitude to both you, Dr. Miller, you Rabbi Parrots, to our amazing audience who is here with us. And I invite you again and again to join us on Biyaka together. We hope to see you again at future events here on Biyaka.